All right, so we are at 12.30. We're going to get probably a lot more folks joining in just the next few minutes. Um, but let me kind of test something really quick. We already got the recording going. Uh, so uh, it looks like everyone that's in here has been in some of the other uh, calls. So you've already done this one or you, this may already sound kind of normal to you. Um, uh, we may mute your mic if we're getting a lot of feedback. And yeah, that's that's kind of it. I'll hand this over to Donna to get started and to tell you about what she's presenting. And uh, yeah, here we go. All right. Um, hello, everybody. I'm going to be presenting on making miniature kites. Specifically, this is going to be a technique that I use with tissue paper and Sharpie markers for the coloring. Um, I'm going to be going through a PowerPoint presentation first that describes how to do this and the different steps of doing this. And from there, I will switch over to a live camera and we can look at some stuff in more detail. And I'll try to keep an eye out for hand raises and questions, but if Nick, if you see one, let me know. So first of all, the supply list for this, everything on here is extremely cheap. I use cheap stuff for these. The tissue paper that I'm using is basically the cheapest I can buy. The stuff that has a shiny side and a matte side like you find at card stores, Walmart, the grocery store works great. That shiny side has a little bit of a coating to it and it controls how much the marker bleeds through the paper. Um, Sharpie markers, various colors and tip sizes. I tend to use both the fine points and the ultra fines. Plain white typing paper, which you'll see the reason for in a minute, tacky glue. The spars are brush bristles, which you get a million in a bundle from American Science Surplus. Regular old thread for the bridle. Needles to poke holes, I'll show you the curved ones that I use. Scissors for cutting, some tape, something for the tail. Hair tinsel works really nice. Christmas tree tinsel looks nice. There's all sorts of things. Something to wind that flying line onto. Embroidery floss winders work really well. And a flying stick. Hey, you Paul can make and your Gary, own by uh, Scott it. Hampton's class was, oh, sorry. Sorry, Donna. <laughs> I didn't mean, I'm okay. closing out another session. I'm sorry. Uh, yep. You can glue a micro clothespin onto a dowel rod, or you can get a pre-made one from American Science Surplus. So first off, planning your sail shape. I have a number of sail shapes that I use over and over and over again. Pretty much anything that's going to work on a large kite is going to work on a small one, and you can get away with things that would be really difficult on full-size kites on miniatures. I've done a lot of asymmetrical kites on miniatures that would be really hard to get to work on a full-size. I make templates for these, and these particular templates are made out of scrap printer's plates. They're like a thin aluminum material that you can cut easily with the scissors. And then from there, I trace the shape that I'm going to use onto a piece of white typing paper. And then once that shape is on the white typing paper, you'll see over on the left, then I start sketching my design. Um, this particular one, I decided I wanted to do a Pegasus. And I decided that I wanted him to only partially be on the image, so I made sure that he extended over the image. So all of that initial sketching was done just with a pencil. And then once I had the design that I wanted, I traced that in um, black Sharpie marker. And the reason for doing the tracing in the heavy black marker is to create lines that are easy to pick up on a scan. I then scan these into the computer for printing. You can also draw this directly in a graphics program if you like working that way, but I find it easier to sketch on the paper by hand and then scan. I then from that point work in Photoshop just because I have it for other reasons and it's easy for me to use. So I get the scan in Photoshop. I then switch it into a grayscale. Your scanner is probably going to think that the background is some odd shade of yellow or blue or who knows what. So at that point, I discard the color information and switch it into grayscale. 
And after it is switched into grayscale, remove the lines, the background completely, because again, your computer probably thinks it's gray now. And if you try to print from that point, you're going to get black lines and some shade of pale gray background. Um, Photoshop has a really easy way to do this using the magic wand. So if you have this tool, you can use the magic wand tool to grab big areas that automatically find these sections. And then you can delete these sections and you'll wind up with this, um, this grid pattern indicates that the background is gone. So at this point you have just your black lines. If your black lines are not dark enough, if your scanner didn't pick it up dark enough or you just don't like how dark it is, you can then push the contrast up to get this nice and dark for your printing. And then you can change your scale size. This particular one, I typically do four and a half inches tall, but you can scale it up and down as you like, which is also another really nice thing with doing this in the computer. You can scale your sales up and down as you choose. So at that point, I have my sale ready to go in the computer. I will then tape a piece of this paper, this cheap tissue paper, onto a piece of white typing paper as a carrier. And the reason I'm going to print these is because that printer ink from the inkjet printer will act like little walls on the paper and help control bleeding when we're getting into the coloring of these. Um, you wanna tape your piece of paper down real good, all the way around. Most inkjet printers that I've tried handle this with no problem at all. You just want to make really sure you have that taped down because if the rollers find anything to grab, they're going to find it and then you're going to have a million little shreds to pull out of your printer. And when I'm putting this on the carrier paper, I'm putting that shiny side down. So I'm putting the matte side up, the shiny side down because that's the way I want to have this paper when I'm actually doing my design. And then once it comes off of the printer, depending on your printer settings, you're going to have your sail shape with your outlines printed onto your tissue paper. You can change, you can adjust your printer for how dark you want this to print. The darker it is, the better it's going to control. Um, depending on how you want your final design to look, you may want this lighter or darker. You can always draw more black back over the top of this when you're done, if you want more intense lines. Donna, when you say uh, shiny side up, you're printing Down. on the shiny side or printing on the not shiny side? Printing on the not shiny side. And this is, I typically buy Hallmark brand paper just because that's what the store has. But I've used cheap stuff from Walgreens. I've used cheap stuff from Walmart. It's all basically the same kind of low quality gift bag tissue paper that has one matte side and one shiny side. Then your Sharpie markers, I buy as many colors as I can possibly find. Um, Michael's is usually a really good source for multi-packs of these things. I find that I mostly use the slightly larger fine points. And I will do de details and small things in these ultra, but I have boxes full of, of both colors. So I like to find as many as I can. And then we'll go into this a little more at the end, but this is a greatly sped up video of what this looks like when you're doing it. So Sharpie markers will dissolve each other. If you start off with one color, you can then blend the next color into it by coloring them over the top of each other and basically blending them wet. So I'll go ahead and run this. And this is sped up 16 times. But you can see when this is wet, how the colors will intentionally bleed into each other. So you can use closely related colors to do the shading in the different areas that you're working on. And those little black printer lines keep most of the bleeding within the area that you're in. Um, when you want to add darker black over the top, you just wait maybe a minute or so until your underlying color is dry. And then you can go ahead and use a black to put those heavier lines back over the top. When I get to the end of this particular one, I wanted some detail in the feathers. So at that point, I used a very fine point Sharpie to draw those in and waited until the whole thing was dry in order to get that in. And you can see I'm kind of going a section at a time, like the tips of these feathers use a slightly different color than the base. And you kind of just color, color 
over the top of each individual one. And yes, you're transferring some color onto your marker from your previous marker, but you really don't notice it as long as the colors that you're using next to each other are closely related. If you were gonna use something like a yellow into a green, then you're probably gonna notice it on the tip of your marker until you color for a while. So then you have your finished sale, however you've decided to do it. You're then going to cut that out. And when I'm cutting these, I typically just cut straight across the bottom of my piece of paper to start, just to give me somewhere to get into it. And I'll cut it in three stages. So I'll do a rough cut once I've cut straight across the bottom to get into my piece of tissue paper, and then cut the actual shape out. But a lot of the times in the course of your drawing this, you've wound up a little bit asymmetrical. So the final step in cutting this out is I will fold them over straight down the middle and then trim off anything that you need to in order to make it absolutely symmetrical if that's what you're going for. Like on this shape, you want it to be symmetrical. And then if you want to have these nice black lines on the edges, once I unfold it, I then go back over it and put those black lines back on the edges. And once you've gotten to that point, you are ready to spar it. Most of the time I use brush bristles from American Science Surplus for my spars. Occasionally I'll split bamboo, but most of the time I'm using these brush bristles. It's pretty much a lifetime supply in one bundle. There's about a bazillion of them in one bundle. And it's like a couple dollars for that. The key is, is that you don't know exactly which ones you're getting when you order them. They have like three or four different styles of them that they sell. So if I'm going to order them, I typically order three or four or five different bundles and hope that I get these ones. These black and white ones are my favorite ones. There are some super fine yellow ones that I've used on occasion, and there's some crimped wrinkly ones that I absolutely hate. Um, most people that buy these are using them for taxidermy. They're simulating whiskers in animals with these. So that's, I think that's their main market for these things, but they're extremely cheap. So even if you have to buy several bundles to get the ones you like, it's still extremely cheap. Then to attach these, tacky glue is your best friend. You don't need much. You barely put any on your spars and then smooth it down with your fingers. You're basically just getting it slightly sticky because these things, they weigh nothing and they're going to stick to your tissue paper almost instantaneously. So you can see over here on the right, there's the little bead of glue and then smooth down and get it onto the spar. The first spar to go on is the center spine. So right down the middle, gets glued down right into that crease that you created from folding it over. Doesn't matter if it sticks off, gonna cut that off later. So I don't even cut it off at this point, I just leave it sticking over and I cut them all at the same time. Then you're going to have your crossbars, your spreaders. The other nice thing about these brush bristles is that you can get them to hold whatever shape you like. So you need a little bit of dihedral in these. You can get them to permanently maintain that shape by running them over the end of your fingernail. So if you just run it right over the end of your fingernail, and I'll show this when we're on the live camera, it'll keep that curve permanently. And you can glue it with that curve right onto the sail. So then you get your top and bottom and you have that built-in dihedral shape already in there. I will then put an extra little dot of glue where the spars cross to make sure they don't try to come apart and trim the excess off all of the corners. And then on to tails, my absolute favorite thing to use for tails is these bags of hair tinsel. They come from beauty supply shops and it's like a extra long, extra extra fine tinsel, hair tinsel. Um, Christmas tinsel works nice, gift bag shreds can work, lightweight ribbon works, feathers work. But I especially like these, and these are the ones I'm going to use in this particular kite. And they come in all sorts of colors. So like these are rainbow ones, you can get them in silver, green, red, whatever you might want. The number 
of them isn't terribly important. I'll just grab a few out of that bag. And this particular bag that I'm working on, I've had for a couple years, so they last quite a while. Grab a few, tie a knot in the end, just to keep them together. And then glue them, starting from that knot, adding a little bit of glue down the first maybe half inch of them, and glue them right down the end of that spine. Then we get into bridling these, and I really like these curved needles for doing my bridles. They are sold for upholstery work and upholstery repairs. The bridle points on this particular shape go on where the spine and the spreaders meet, top and bottom. So you'll have one loop, top to bottom, tied on both ends, and then I put a little pigtail on with a Prusik knot, just like you would on a large kite so that it's adjustable and you can find its happy spot when you're trying to fly it. I have a little video of putting the bridle on these so that you can see how the needle works when it's going around these spars. So what I'm gonna do is come from the front and just go in and out around that cross point of the spar with that curved needle and it's way easier to do with the curved needle than it is with a straight one. And tie that point on. I'm going to do the same thing on the bottom. This is just leftover sewing thread. So when I've got like a spool that's got a little bit on that I don't want to put on my machine, I'll save it and use it for miniature kite bridles. Trim that end off. Go down and do the same thing on the bottom. And the length of this loop isn't terribly important, but I like to make it just slightly shorter than the points on the kite so that it doesn't try to get tangled up when you're flying it. We'll trim that off. I have on occasion put like just a dot of glue on these points, but most of the time I don't think it's necessary. As long as you get a couple knots in there, they stay put. And then the pigtail piece is just like you do on a large kite, doubled over, make a pigtail. And most of these kites are happy with the toe point approximately a third of the way down from the top. But I make it adjustable just so that I can if one comes up a little different. So there's that, now it's got its bridle. Then for your winders, one of the most convenient things you can use for miniature kite winders is these little embroidery floss cards that you can get from any craft store embroidery materials. Um, they're really cheap. You get a whole bunch of them in a box, and they're nice because you can actually trap the end of your flying line in this little slit that's in there so that you don't have either extra trying to come off or it trying to wind itself up. And then this little rod over here on the right is the ones that American Science Surplus sells. They're telescoping and they make great little flying sticks. And I think they're like three or four dollars each. 
And then it's ready to fly. And the end of the stick, there it goes. Donald, do you want to do just the tail uh, to qualify to compete? It's got to raise up 15 degrees off the horizontal when it flies. And so you end up trimming up the tails as you try to figure that out. That's right. Either trimming the tail or adjusting the toe point to get the at least 15 degrees or some of both. Usually this uh, this hair tinsel, you don't have to trim much. It's super lightweight. So I typically use it at full length. Um, I have a pet bag of it here before I switch to my other camera. You can see how long this stuff is. And I typically use this stuff full length. It says this particular bag is 20 inches. So I'm more likely to adjust my toe point if I've got one that's flying low than I am to trim the tails, but I have done both. Now the next thing I'm going to do is switch to my other camera and some of this closer up unless there's some other I do that. Hi Donna, Barb Meyer here. I just wanted to make one comment about um, sparring because some people mm -hmm. may not have, may want to do this today and not have stuff. Uh, monofilament fishing line is really yep. great to use. It comes with a built-in curve. And the other thing is, if you don't have that, just go grab your household broom and whack yep. a couple of bristles out of that. And that will be just fine to get you started. I saw Rena had this look on her face and took off. So those are my two suggestions on uh, what to do when you just got to make a kite and you don't have the stuff yet. Yep, that's exactly right. Basically, anything that's skinny and lightweight is fine. Or another one that I've used is cat whiskers, cat's shed whiskers. If you need tapered spars, I have saved my cat whiskers in a little box that my cats shed. And they make nice little, little tapered miniature spars. <laughs> another one is horsehair. If you have access to horsehair, that works good too. Horsehair brushes, horsehair bristles, actual hair off of a horse. Anything like that. So let me switch to my other camera. Oh, hey, Donna. Th <clears throat> this is Lindsay. Um, so um, uh, Mel uh, Hickman um, had one of his uh, ro miniature rokakus uh, uh, about so big, and the, and the spine was a tiger whisker. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and uh, he got that. Uh, his friend was a vet and was going to be um, doing some dental work on a tiger at the zoo. And he says, uh, do you want a couple whiskers? And he says, oh, yeah, that's good. Cool. That's cool. So, en so enlist your vet for tiger whiskers. Yeah, and en en enlist your exotic animal vet. Right. <laughs> that, that would be cool to say you had tiger's whiskers on a guy. Let's see if I can get a decent focus here. Donna, uh, carbon fiber works pretty well, too. Yeah, if it's small enough. Yeah, and sometimes you can peel it off of broken spars. Yeah, that's true. Those little shreds. They come off of broken spars, yep. I am going to grab this. So as far as all of these designs, I keep a sketchbook, and I'm actually going to raise my camera up a little bit so that Just I can use my designs. For Go one ahead. second, Donna, um, for those of you uh, that may have changed your layout, you're going to have to click on Donna's, um, her little icon and pin her to the page so you can see what uh, she's showing on her screen. Okay, back to it. Got it? So I keep my little templates in a little bag in the front of my sketchbook. So they're right there whenever I want to use them. And then I keep any of my little base drawings. This is the sketchbook that I'm working on right now. So I could redo any of these at any time I want to make one in another color. 
Some of you might recognize this swan from UMake a couple years ago was the one we did in the class. And then there is, let me see one of the asymmetrical ones. Here's one of the original sketches for an asymmetrical one. Some of you might have seen this owl. I don't know how well that's showing up for you. The video isn't coming through very well. Donnie, you've lost focus. I wonder if instead of using that one, if it would help if I switched to my phone instead, if you guys are having trouble seeing it. Because it looks good on my end, but I'm afraid you might be losing bandwidth here somewhere. Yeah, I'm, I'm not seeing it very well. Let me try doing this then. So I can... I'm running you on the phone too. So if I turn this on... You may have to look at the any other one of me. I'm going to put this camera. You're going to be looking at the ceiling for a second. I can put this phone on my tripod here instead of this other camera that we may be having bandwidth issues with. Yeah, I think I'm seeing compression issues. Let me see if this one possibility would be to turn off the phone and bring the picture closer to your camera. That way you gain bandwidth and you gain closeness. Well, I'm not actually running on the same internet. I've got the phone running on 5G and the computer's running on Wi Fi to try to avoid that. You should be set. So. Let's see if this is going to show, because now I can't see what I'm doing. I think that actually the amazing part of your running it on two separate systems is that Washington, Missouri just went through rural electrification in 2004. <laughs> Practically. Huh? Are you seeing the second instance of me? Is it showing up? Because it's not. Sh I'm not able to see what I'm doing here. I see your ceiling. You see my ceiling. Okay, so then I need to. Well, that's interesting. I'm seeing her. In your forehead. Uh, you see my ceiling. I do. That forehead. I see your symbol. The yeah, D. folks will have to okay. go into the the list of participants the and find find the other Donna Hutchins that's on mute and, there and you go. click the three yeah. dots and, and pin that one. Yes. Good, Good job, Donna. I say it looks to me like you should have it. Yes, perfect. You got it? A little bit of your wristwatch. If you can find the other one of me to pin. Yeah, just reorient the cameras. So, uh, oh, no, no, no. Wait a minute. Never mind. Never mind. You're opening your book. Say, there you go. Yes, perfect. I was opening the book. Got it. Opening the book. So the book I should will show shut up. up. Okay. So this one is Upside the one down. I was trying to show. Upside down. <clears throat> You're okay. That's better. Okay. Yeah, this one, this owl is this asymmetrical design I was trying to show. And you can see that the moon extended over the edge, and so did the branches for the tree. Mm -hmm. And this thing flew pretty well. I did some small little um, spars in these branches to hold them stiff. It's something like this would have been really hard to get away with on a full-size kite. And it flew pretty well on a miniature. <clears throat> so these sorts of things are, are pretty fun to do. And it was the same, the same tissue paper. Yeah, same tissue paper, same tissue paper, same spars. I did use a little bit of split bamboo on this, some very small things on this one to get them stiff. But the majority of this was exactly the same technique with the cheap tissue paper, the cheap paintbrush bristles, and the Sharpie marker coloring. So that's the book. Donna, yes. I'm going to interrupt just a second. If uh, everybody meets themselves and use the space bar to pull the shooting on and off, they want to talk. Lindsay, you've got a lot of dropout. You pixelator. You dropped out a bunch there, Lindsay. Okay. That's because I was holding my space key down. 
you can use the space key to toggle your microphone on and off so um, people can easily unmute themselves just with their space bar. All right, I'll try to get this in, in screen. So this one is another color version of the same Pegasus that I did. So this guy is basically ready for cutting out. And then I've got some more printed out that I was going to show live how this coloring technique works. Um, what you want to do is I leave these guys on the paper. I do all the coloring with this thing left on the paper. The reasons for that is that it, number one, stabilizes it because the tissue paper is basically really thin and somewhat fragile and it bleeds like crazy through to the back. So in addition to having it on the piece of white paper, paper towel underneath the protector table. So that all goes in a stack in order to protect my table that I'm working with. I'm gonna bring this down a little bit closer yet and grab some markers. And as you can see, I've got like a million of these in every color I could possibly find. And let's say, let's see, what color do we want to do this guy? Let's have a green horse this time. So I will then grab a group of related marker colors. So these are the greens I've got. And maybe I'll grab this fluorescent one too, to use for some highlights. So what I'm going to do when I'm working on certain areas is I will have all of the markers in that grouping already open and ready to go. So I'm gonna have those open, ready to go, lined up for what I'm gonna do. And I want this guy's face to be the lightest color. So I'll start coloring it in, and I wanna work with this while it's wet. So I've got that lighter color, then I'm gonna come in with this darker color, and then I'm gonna come back over the top again with the lighter one. These markers dissolve each other, so you can get a really nice shading effect by going back and forth with your colors over the top of each other. So I'm frequently working in at least three or four different colors at a time.
So Donna, while you're coloring, there is a question from Paul, uh, a couple a couple points. It says, I'm confused, are you coloring on the tissue paper? I think the answer there is yes, you've got a layer of tissue paper on top of printing paper on top of um, paper towel, right? To kind of protect your table and such and provide some stiffness. And then what did you jet paint, jet print onto it as a boundary? I, I think you printed the black lines, right? With an ink ink printer while the tissue was connected to the printer paper. Is that how that worked? I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know if she heard you, but that's true. The tissue paper is, is taped onto printer paper and put through the, the uh, inkjet. Right. And there's a follow up question there if it would work with a laser printer. I'm guessing. Uh, I actually tried on a laser printer. Uh, it prints okay, but it doesn't seem to be stopping the spread of ink as much as an inkjet might. I've used a uh, laser jet, I mean, uh, uh, a laser printer, and I haven't had any trouble at all. A laser printer uses plastic toner to lay down on top of the uh, the paper and then gets pressed down inside. An inkjet actually hits and penetrates this uh, paper uh, much more easily and much more thoroughly. Say, I have to say that the that the laser jet certainly makes a nice sharp line on the on the paper. No. Yes, it does. And Donna, you're on mute in case you've been trying to uh, comment on these bits. I'm not sure if you were trying to or not. No, oh, the computer apparently muted itself without me touching it. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I have not actually tried using a laser jet. I have one, but my particular laser jet is prone to jamming all the time. So in the interest of not picking shreds of tissue paper out of the laser jet, I've just never tried it. I would worry with the laser jet if you've got any kind of tape going through it, because the laser jet, as part of the process, heats the paper up very, very hot to melt the uh, toner, to fuse mm -hmm. it. And yep. if it gets stuck in some place, it could be... Uh, an expensive issue for you. Yeah, it could I be. Put, I usually put a very thin strip of double-sided tape at the leading edge between the typing paper and the tissue paper, and then run it through my laser printer. And when I uh, remove the tissue paper, I can see that there's uh, ink already printed right through the tissue paper onto the regular paper. But really, my trick here is to use a very thin strip of tape uh, that I cut to a thin strip with uh, scissors. Yeah, and that makes sense. I've got, I go, go all the way around just because of history with my printer, hmm. trying to grab things from the edges. <laughs> but I could potentially see issues with that. So now I've got this green down here. And now if I want to switch colors, say if I want to use some pinks, reds, so I want to make his mane like a fluorescent pink. You know, and I got missed a spot with some green there. This should be green. This has had enough time now that it's pretty well dry. And you don't have this bleed happening through in between these layers. So now I can go into the next section and start on my next color. And these Sharpies come in so many colors. You've got so many options here in order to do this that it's really cool. <coughs> and Michaels is prone to having coupons a lot of the time on full price stuff. So I will frequently get my Sharpie markers whenever I, they have coupons. Hey, Donna. Yes. Um, if you don't have access to a printer, do you have a pen or an ink pen or something that you would use to draw that wouldn't uh, bleed into the uh, tissue paper? I have used gel pens, and they seem to work okay. I have also used Sharpie markers themselves, just with being a whole lot more careful and letting it dry in between. 
And like, for example, if I want more details on this, which I might, you might've seen it on that other one. If I let that dry, like that face has already been dry for a while at this point, I can now go back in and add some details and it's not gonna bleed as much. It works the absolute best if you can print. What you're looking for is a pen that has a different carrier. Sharpie yeah. use alcohol, so you can't use another pen that uses alcohol because it'll carry it out. Um, in my case, since I use water-based pens in my paint, I use an alcohol-based uh, grafting pen for my hard lines. And that acts as a resist. So you, you want to make sure that... Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, you you want to make sure that whatever pens you pick up have different car uh, different carriers, and you can smell them, and you'll go, oh, this one's definitely alcohol, and then these are water or whatever like that. Yeah, yeah and I don't smell them for too long because you'll lose track of where you were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is that. Like if we do some feathers in here, it's more easy to see on these lighter colors how this blending works. And I'll go back, just back and forth in between these colors to get the blend. And at this point, it doesn't matter if you wind up over the edges a little bit, it's gonna be cut off anyway. Have you ever tried watercolor um, pencils uh, um, on tissue paper? On tissue paper, I have not. On regular paper, yes, I have, but not on tissue paper. I don't know if it would it absorb. Might be interesting. Might be interesting to try. And then once again, just after a couple minutes, when this stuff is dry, if you want some more details, you can go back in and add them. As long as you're basically quick about it. You can get some little feather details in here. And maybe you want some of this to feather out a little bit, so maybe you come in here and do this while it is still a little bit wet, depending on what you want and how you want this to show up. You want him to have some teeth? I could add some teeth. We don't need to go ahead and completely finish this one if there's anything else you want to see on the other one that's ready to add out. You'd like to see maybe the spars. That's Find a good a black idea. one that'll show up. Did we see a close to the kite with the spars all attached? Yes, we can do that. Here is that one. Here's the finished one. can see it's showing up okay on the camera. Mm -hmm. There's the back of it. And, and I've got in the front. bridle in the front. Looks like that. And I've can got... Can you show us your technique for the bars? Yes, I can do that. Put him back in his box. And as far as boxes for these, there's all sorts of different things you can find. I typically bring home um, waste boxes from work. I work in a lab and we get plastic pipette tip boxes, which is mostly what I use, but you can use whatever. So here's a spar, brush bristle. And if you want it to get that dihedral curve, just running it over your fingernail until you get the shape you want. You can get as tight as you want or as shallow as you want and it'll hold that shape. If you want to have one with a hard bend, they'll do that too. As I said, I've got like about a lifetime supply in this thing. So here's the, the lifetime supply of these guys. If you want a hard bend in one, you can just use your fingernail and put it in there. 
and it'll hold that too. I really like these because of the way they'll hold shape. And then if I wanted to glue this on, I would just get my tacky glue out, let's get my tacky glue out, and just put the smallest little bead on there, smallest little bead, and then run that little small bead over it, just with your fingers. Basically, all you want is for this to be sticky, not soaked in glue. And then it's going to stick on to your kite once it's sticky like that. And then my little needles that I use for the bridling, they come in bunches. I usually get these from a craft store, especially one that has upholstery stuff. So they'll sell them with upholstery repair. I happen to like the smaller one. The big ones, big ones are a little too big. I like these small ones the best. And since they've got that curve, you can scoop right underneath the spar and get your thread through there without having to go up and down with a straight needle. Flying sticks, if you haven't seen one of these from American Science Surplus, it extends. This particular one goes really, really long. It's probably about, I'm going to say about 18, 20 inches or so when it's fully extended. And it just gets the kite away from your body and out of the turbulence of the body. Anything in particular you want to see otherwise? Because it's going to take us longer than the time to actually finish one. Uh, I have a Barbara, I see you're on there twice, so that might be why yeah. there's there's feedback uh, coming through. Now you seem to be muted. Hey, Lindsay, did you have something? Your hand was up. Da, da, da. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, it looks like Barbara Meyer's back on. Yeah, I'm. I'm back on. Just one of me. I have a question about glue. Okay. Do you ever have glue go old so it won't work anymore? Yes, I've had that issue. And I've also had tacky glue begin to stink and smell like a dead animal. So, I mean, I think I've had some of my glues, like, separate. I don't know if I maybe stored it upside, if I should store it upside down or on its side. Any other you know, out there? Um, that I, I really like the new tacky glue bottles that are stored basically on their nose the whole time. Uh, any kind of uh, uh, PVA glue, and I, tacky glue is probably a polyvinyl acetate, will separate uh, if it gets too cold. That could be my problem because my house is pretty darn cold. Yeah. Yeah, I've got uh, bookbinders glue, and it's never gone bad. I like these new bottles of tacky glue that have the, the cap is on the bottom, and they're stored like that. that Better makes, than the old ones. Let me let me say something about that. The, I, the idea is that if any of that forms uh, a little um, clot, it floats to the top and it doesn't obstruct mm -hmm. the uh, opening. Yep. <laughs> so you should you should in fact store your glue upside down with a just like that. Yeah. These bottles make it super convenient. All right, with that, I'm going to hop on over and get this other session started. Uh, I believe it's Mitch with the Dresden plate. Uh, it looks like we still have Spence in here. He is also one of the moderators. Um,
but uh, this session can continue to happen. And again, like the other ones, uh, it will keep recording and continue on until the last person leaves. So I'm gonna hop out of this one and get the next one started. I'll meet you over there. So the other thing about glue um, in my 40 years of using uh, tight bond uh, woodworking glue, which is the polyvinyl acetate, um, if it does separate, you can stir it up. It's uh, unless the, you know, something's really nasty with it. But uh, I've got gallons of glue that, you know, will separate out if it's too cold in my shop. And I just uh, put a dowel inside of it and stir it up. And, uh, and I haven't had anything fail. So that may be an option too. And then Donna, when you're all done, uh, I have other markers to talk about. Uh, cool. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. I are you you're not you're are are we all done with your portion of it more or less? And what? Yeah, unless other people have specific questions they want to ask. Yeah, I'll, I mean, if, if anybody does, uh, go ahead. Otherwise, I'll just uh, chime in here. Um, so everybody good? Okay. Anyway, um, I'm playing right now with a, a Micron technical pin and seeing if it uh, resists uh, the alcohol-based markers. Uh, but I, I, I have, I've done what you're doing, but haven't done it for a long time. But if uh, I'm thinking, have you ever drawn, uh, taken, you know, and just sketched in pencil, do your coloring, and then come back over the top with a technical pen or a fine point sharpie? Yep, I have done that as well. Okay, so so that so if somebody doesn't have access to a printer, I would suggest doing that. But 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 your pen or your printing is also, like you say, is is uh, kind of blocking the bleed from one to the other slightly. Um, yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. Now, uh, the what I was going to talk about are Copic markers. Have you ever used Copics? I've seen them, but haven't really used them. Oh, you need to use them. <laughs> First of all, they're refillable. They're, they're more money. They're refillable. They have blenders, blender pens that are neutral color. And... Um, they uh, let's see let me take my turn my camera on here and um, uh, let me go to droid cam so I can see what I'm doing uh, 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 uh. rearrange my tripod here anyway okay so this is a this is a Copic marker uh, this is their um, Sketch is the the name, and I'll put the link uh, or uh, in chat. Anyway, so the cool thing about the sketch is that it's chisel tip on one side, and then it's a brush on the other. And also, the chisel tip goes into an airbrush and it converts it into an airbrush and you can either use a can of compressed air or um, hook it up to a small air compressor and what it does is that it just blows air across the the chisel tip where's my camera at da, 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 da. there everybody see that and these are amazing they're they're not cheap uh, they're probably about, I think, I don't know, seven bucks a, a pen, but you can go on Amazon and buy sets. Uh, they come in 300 or almost 400 colors. And uh, they're, they're just, uh, hence, dare I say, remarkable. <laughs> they're, they're, really, <laughs> they're really good. Uh, I, I, I've used them quite a bit. And the airbrush technique, uh, the airbrush, is is great for shading 
and uh, and you can do some pretty fine stuff. So there's tons of videos uh, online on coping markers on people, you know, for you know, the you know scrapbooking, but but commercial artists use these. Um, and but what I like is if you're going to do a lot of this stuff, um, you know, uh, you can uh, refill your pens. Uh, let's see what else was it. But but the blender is really good. Those work well. Uh, the other thing is, is that if you want um, little handles, of course, uh, you can always. Uh, oops, did I lose my camera? Hang yeah, on. it seems like we lost everybody for a minute. Yeah, I'm using Droid Cam on a on a cell phone camera here. Uh, uh, uh. Error, error, damn it. <laughs> Video connection lost. Here, let me unplug it. Donna. Um, Go on, ahead, talk. Online, you've got a picture of you hanging around with a uh, butterfly quad line kite. Did you do that with markers? Um, the, the quad line kite of mine? No, that's applique. Oh, cool. Okay. Thank yeah. you. And, and also design master spray paint. Uh, so it's also spray painted for the shading. Uh, that one had large pieces of fabric spray painted before they were used for applique to get the shading on them. Right. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Plus, you won People's Choice Award because you beat me out because you were using my <laughs> lights. That's true. I used your lights. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. Anyway. <laughs> I um, like your lights. Yeah. They're nice yeah, lights. Yeah. God, I keep losing my camera here. Uh, hang on. Uh, no, I'm, I'm just there. getting a D with, on my There's screen. The I'm not getting an image at all. Get a Mac, Lindsay. <laughs> No, no, no. It has nothing to do with that. I'm using. Oh, the, a, yeah, the, the little winders. The little winders are good. Yeah, yeah. So, so if anybody wants these, you can contact me. Um, the little wood winders. See, they're only that big. These I designed for Charlie Sodich. Actually, they they're a reduction of my big winders because he wanted some, and I sent him a hundred, and he only wanted two. So, <laughs> but he didn't have a choice. So, and they're. Uh, Baltic birch plywood, they're three plies of plywood, one and a half millimeters thick. So they're cool. cool. They're enough about me. So has anybody been coloring one along with the session? There's one. Looks good. You're muted. It's my first one. Ever. Very nice. Very nice. Looks good. Thanks. I think you're muted also. Dave. Yep. Uh, this is a Tombow marker that I use on miniatures. And the difference between uh, the Sharpies and the Tombow is Tombow is water based, Sharpies are alcohol based. So they do essentially do a resist for each other. Uh, this one has a brush tip on one side, watercolor brush tip, and a hard tip on the other side. Yeah, we also have a set of those uh, watercolor <clears throat> brushes. But Dave, the, they're not permanent though. So if you get your kite, your miniature wet, it's going to bleed. You're correct? absolutely correct. Okay. And if you did that you get... with your average Japanese kite, the same thing would happen. Well, yeah, but you could always uh, spray it with a little fixative or, or hairspray or even a little bit of spray lacquer. Just get a little uh, can at the hardware store and uh, and top coat it. Then Then you're done. Because we used to use fixative spray on all of our illustrations when we were doing uh, watercolor uh, illustrations. But as Charlie would say, that just adds weight. Uh, no, it, uh, no, it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. He would say yeah. that. Yeah, if you could measure it, I'm gonna, I'm you're, gonna. You're, you're way better than I. <laughs> <laughs> 
Let's see. I've played it with a matte sealant, but I haven't used it much on. I haven't used it much yet. I've played a little bit with a spray matte sealant. I will see you in the next uh, booth. Real quick, could we see the, the first time kite um, builder? I didn't have my um, uh, camera working properly or uh, my screen, and I'd love to see it again. Yep, yours. And you're muted. There we go. Okay. I got myself unmuted, and I hurried up. And so this is how I. Oh, he's done. Him. He looks cool. If you guys want to screen grab that, go ahead. That's lovely. Thank you. And I also I got my broom out, like Barb said, and the bristles are really thick on my broom, um, but I was able to split them, believe it or not, and. Yep. Uh, and I think I don't think that they're completely even in um, diameter all the way across. So I think I'm going to use like the the part that's I don't know, like it it doesn't feel like it's the same. Like it feels like it's thicker at one end. It probably it, is, like, but is it going to like if I if I put one be. going one way on the top and the other one going the other way on the bottom? In essence, that would balance it out, wouldn't it? Yeah, just get it as close as possible. Find the spot that's you think as close as possible. Okay, because so I can't find my clear fishing line. So and adding more tails may help. Okay. If, it, if it's trying to lean one way or the other, adding more tails may help. Okay, thanks. Turn mine. Turn mine around. That way. Anybody else? Questions, comments, discussion? So Donna, for cutting out, you find the best technique is just sharp scissors? Yep, sharp scissors. I happen to like this one. Oh, I have those. Those are good. Yeah, I happen to like this one quite a bit for cutting these things out. <coughs> so Donna. Donna, I'm using, uh, I'm just playing here, um, and I've got, um, I'm using these Copics, which are alcohol-based also, uh, but the uh, technical pen that I'm using, the Micron technical pen, and I'm on tissue paper doing this by hand, and the technical pen is not bleeding. It's not, I mean, it, it's, uh, not. they're... Can you see that? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's on tissue paper. I, I just did a rough shape with the technical pen, put some color on it. I haven't done any blending, um, but uh, that was, I'm gonna grab a blender pen and, and see how that works real quick here. See what um, it does. Yeah. Yeah, the other ones that I've used are those gel pens on occasion. I'm not sure what their base is. Um, gel pens are, I think, are um, water. Um, yeah, this is working really well. The blender, the blender pen actually liquefies it really quickly. The other thing that uh, Rhonda uses on the Rokaku on Tyvek is just uh, alcohol with mm -hmm. uh, either sponges or you could use Q-tips and uh, just dip it in and uh, and you can blend your uh, your stuff around. Now these blender pens have a chisel tip and a paintbrush or a, a, a sharp point. So you can blend, uh, you know, fine details. Um, I'm almost done here. I'm just doing this real quick. And you can do like a circular motion and, and, and really blend it in the field. And get some, uh, okay. So that was. Oh yeah. Okay, so all I did is that that was uh, solid out to the green, not touching the green, and then just uh, using the blender and, and 
and bringing it in. And so that was bringing it in. right. Anyway, so that's just a, a little bit uh, of what it'll do, what the Copics will do. And with the uh, Micron uh, technical pin. So are, is, are, is there going to be a list of resources after these things if people, um, well, I'll, I'll talk to Nick because she'll probably post it so I can put links. Yeah. You know, because that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's yeah. the Micron. You should be able to. Yeah. And the great thing about the Microns is that, that being a technical pin, this is a 0.5 millimeter. You can get like 0.25, I think, or 0.2. You can get, you know, all different widths. So you can do so, so. So your black lines can be of various widths without having to go over it more than once. And I think, and maybe it's tomorrow. I think Mitch is doing a kite making items session, like tools and tricks and stuff. Yes, and yes, that yes. Might be good for that too. Yeah, yeah. So I'll go ahead and and uh, put something together before my uh my o dark 30 class at 8 30. <laughs> yeah yeah so so um it, i'm the i'm the late comer to uh presenters so i will be presenting um uh 3d cad um computer aided design modeling and uh 3d printing it's not going to be a how-to it's just going to be a um this is what you can do so like this little guy right here is uh, is all 3D printed. So, so Lindsay, if I can interrupt, Mitch is doing a presentation at 1.30 and we're a few minutes late getting to that. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, so if anybody needs right. to go, go. So I'm done. Any other, yeah, any other questions, commentary, or should we go see Mitch's session? I'm done. Mm -hmm. Don't hear anything from anybody else.